good morning, church. How is everyone today? Yes, thank you for the excitement. Uh, so a couple of announcements. I was genuinely excited about your excitement. I was thinking like, oh, the, it was just a lot fuller last service, but you guys brought the punch. So you guys equaled out with them and their excitement. So good for you. Um, a couple of things. This Wednesday at their traditional service at the sanctuary, we are having a Thanksgiving Eve service at 7 o'clock. So we'd love to come have you join us with that and, and bring your families who are in town with you. And then um, we are giving away Thanksgiving meal kits for families in need. So these are the ingredients to make a Thanksgiving meal that you can go home and cook yourself. We have set aside some just for the Zion families. So if you are part of our church family, which you are, you're here, and you need a meal, please let me know. You can meet me out at the info desk after church, and we'll get you signed up for one. And last, well, not... I think lastly, we are, look, we're representing our Christmas by the Lake outreach. These are the volunteer t-shirts we'll be wearing that day. So one, if you've already signed up to serve, grab a t-shirt. You can take that with you. And secondly, like, thank you so much, guys. Our first shift is full. Like, that's over 50 volunteers who signed up for that first shift. So that's pretty amazing. But we do need more from 2 to 4.30. So if you want to serve... If I can entice you with a nice t-shirt, meet me out, out at the info desk and we'll get you signed up. With that, stand up, tell your neighbor your favorite Thanksgiving meal, and then we'll worship. Ham. That is my favorite meal. Ham. Turkey. Let's all stand. Come and worship. All right, you guys ready to worship? All right, let's come and bring it to the Lord. Here we go. Saturday was silent. Surely it was through. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? Friday's disappointment. It's Sunday's empty tomb Since when has it possible to ever stop you? This is the sound of the dry bones rattling This is the praise make a dead man walk again Of the dry bones rattling. Pentecostal fire stirring something new. Oh, we're not gonna run out of miracles anytime soon. Resurrection power around the mind. My God is able to save. Here we go. My God is able to save and deliver and heal and restore anything that he wants to. Just ask the man who was thrown on the boats of Elijah if there's anything that he can.
a little repeat here. I'm going to sing it out. I want you guys to follow me. You guys ready for this? Here we go. I hear the sound.
You are good to me. Let your heart be trouble. Hold your head up. I don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. Take courage, hold on.
Can we just give a clap to the Lord? Yes, God, you are good. You may be seated. Like Christ, molded by his Father, so are we born. Whether it be by worldly pattern or by our heavenly creator, we are molded, shaped, born. What shape are you? I know that's a whole lot of Jason up there. <laughs> How's everybody doing today? Wow. <laughs> that was... Wow, that was, okay, how's everybody doing today? A little, a little better, okay. Uh, well, hey, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. You know, I, I want to share, um, I know she's not in the room. Caitlin Straup has filled in as our interim worship director and has done just a phenomenal job kind of keeping us going in the directions that we need to. Can we just give a thank you to Caitlin? And I know she's not in here, but um, I don't know that you guys realize this, but Worship, when we sing, it is the one time that the Bible tells us that we minister to the Lord is through our worship. In all other times, it's God ministering to us, whether it be through the message, through prayer, through his word. But when we sing, when we lift our voices to God, that is us ministering to the heart of God. And there's something holy and beautiful that takes place in that. And, and I got to tell you, it takes a lot of work and time and the, the commitment of the band and the people that are consistently trying to make sure that we can come and worship. And so can we give a thank you to the worship team and to production? And, um, and here's why I share all this. So we are in a season where a lot of our people end up going south for the winter because they're smart. Because uh, <laughs> it's really cold here. Um, but we actually, this is not something that we can do by ourselves. And we actually need people who want to step in and help in that ministry of worship. And sometimes it's technology. If you can sing, uh, if you can play an instrument, we'd love for you to try out and, and to be a part of what is going on here. But I know sometimes we're like, well, Jason, I can't sing. I don't have a lick of talent in my body in that. Everybody do this. Can everybody do this? Okay, if you can do this, you can do production. <laughs> like that's all it is, just tapping a button. If you can do that, you're already doing 90% of the work. Um, but here's why I say this, is that we really believe in what God does in and through the ministry of music. And I started off, I don't know if you know this, but I started off in worship. That's where I began. And it was in music and in worship that I first really connected with the Lord. Yeah, I confessed and believed Jesus is my Lord and Savior. But it was in that worship time where I really learned God's love for me. And I'm privileged and I'm grateful that I get to do and lead worship periodically. But that's a whole lot of Jason up there. I'll just be honest, between preaching and everything else. And, and so we really believe in the importance of raising up other people into their gifts and their talents. And I hope that you'll consider being a part of that. With all that being said, my name is Jason. If you're new here and you don't know me, uh, I'm one of the pastors here. I want to say thank you to those that are watching online. Thank you for joining us today. We know you could be anywhere. And if you're looking for a church home, we prayerfully really hope that you'd consider making Zion a place where you could come and be a part of what God is doing here. Um, God's doing some pretty cool stuff, and it's really encouraging to see. Uh, before we go any further, I have a fun video to show you guys. It's kind of setting us up for today, and I'll be honest, 1990, Jason, would have absolutely loved what you're about ready to watch, so everybody check this out. Wait, no, just keep an eye out on the dude. It gets so much better. All right, I think we get the idea. Okay, how many, okay, wait, first of all, y'all know I broke dance. What, what? Come on now. Uh, all joking aside, like in 1992, I'd have been like, dude, that is so awesome. We need to do that in church. How many of you guys remember when that was cool? And what's, what's crazy is I don't know if these guys realize that they've now become popular, but probably not for the reason they wanted. And I promise we're going somewhere. It's not just to poke fun at some of the silly things that happen in church. Um, but here's what has happened, and we're, we really are going somewhere. 
you know, uh, and there's actually online, if you watch, there are, uh, there are ways, like 10 ways to know if you grew up in the 90s and the early 2000s, if you were in youth group in the 90s and 2000s. You guys ready for these? This is, I did not make up this list. If your youth group sang and knew all the hand motions to Big House from Audio and Adrenaline, you might have been in the youth group in the 90s and 2000s. If you had a WWJD bracelet, anybody remember the WWJD bracelet? If you had that bracelet, you might have grown up in the 90s and 2000s. If you were never allowed to watch the Smurfs, for some reason, you might have been raised in the 90s and 2000s in church. If you attended multiple Acquire the Fire conferences, how many of you guys know what Acquire the Fire is? All right, see, there were a conference for youth group kids, and I actually proposed to my wife at Acquire the Fire in 2000, true story, 2001, taking our youth group kids. Last but not least, well, actually, second to last, if the earliest you ever got up in high school was to go to see you at the poll, you might have been raised in the 90s and 2000s. See, see you at the poll was when everybody across the nation gathered together for a time of prayer. And it was awesome to see kids from all over. But the real sign, and this is my favorite one, that you knew that you were raised in the 90s and 2000s is if you had a secret stash of secular music. Some of you are laughing, and, and here's the thing. In the 90s, uh, there was this whole movement that started in the 80s, went into the 90s, and the part in 2000, where it became an us versus them. And the goal was, was to get rid of all your secular music. Secular means non-Christian. And I would go to conferences, and I would go to youth groups, and the pastors or the speaker, whoever it was, would encourage us by saying, listen, garbage in, garbage out. Now, I actually just talked about this a couple weeks ago, right? That what we put into our minds actually comes out of us eventually. And so the idea was is that you need to get rid of the garbage in your life. And the best way to do it was to throw away or better yet burn all of your secular music. And there's always that one kid who's like, yeah, I burned it all. And he didn't. He kept it all secret stash, right? And I did this multiple times. I remember there was a time where I got rid of all my cassette tapes. That's how old I am. Um, I got rid of all my cassette tapes of my secular music because my youth group, my youth pastor said, we need to get rid of all the secular music because it's polluting us. And then in my early 20s, I got rid of a ton of CDs. And if you went to a Christian bookstore, do you guys remember bookstores Be besides Barnes & Noble? If you went to a Christian bookstore, you would usually find a sign over the music that said something like this. If you like Limp Biscuit, you'll love Pax 217. Or if you like Eminem, You'll love KJ5 too. And the idea was is that we need to get away from secular, only go to Christian. And even Weird Al, that's right, Weird Al. You guys remember Weird Al? Even Weird Al, who did parodies of pop songs, was not safe because he wasn't Christian. So we had to have a Christian parody of Weird Al parodying. It's like a fourth generation parody. I don't know. But the whole thing was is that we had to be separate from the world. And as, because we couldn't sing, ooh, baby, I love your ways, so we had to change the lyrics to, ooh, Jesus, I love your ways. And all the people who aren't Christian are like, that's lame. <laughs> and we, we did it, but why did we do it? I remember, and, and some of you might remember this, the biggest scandal in Christian music was in the early 90s when Amy Grant crossed over and went secular. And she came out with the song, Baby, Baby. You guys remember this? And it was like all over the news, Amy Grant walks away from Christian music, and, and I'll be the honest, I was one of the first ones to throw her under the bus and condemn her because that's secular, and I would point my fingers and all the judgment that I had because, you know, Baby Baby was such a horrible song. And where did that come from? It's amazing how much has changed in 30 years. Would you agree with that? I mean, now, let's think about it. Now we celebrate when a band, a Christian band, is seen on the secular market. Switchfoot. When Switchfoot all of a sudden became recognized for being good musicians, you're like, that's our people! Or if you're into heavy metal or rock, P.O.D. When P.O.D. came onto the, sound, onto the sign, all of a sudden we were like, yes! And now something unique has happened. We actually draw attention and celebrate when celebrities, movie stars, musicians, producers, and athletes who say they're Christian because they're part of our tribe. Now we celebrate them. Thank you, Chris Pratt, Justin Bieber, Mark Wahlberg, Carrie Underwood, Stephen Colbert, Denzel Washington, and let's not forget Tim Tebow. What shifted? What shifted in us that now all of a sudden, like we celebrate when so we can claim a celebrity as part of our tribe? 
And this morning, we're going to continue in this series called Formation, which is talking about spiritual formation. And I promise we're getting somewhere. See, here's the thing. We know, and this is what we talked about the very first week, is that we as human beings are shaped. Our minds and our emotions are shaped and formed by the stories of our lives. The stories spoken over us, the stories that we speak over ourselves, the experiences we have, all of them shape how we see the world, how we see God, and how we see others, but more importantly, also how we see ourselves. But as Christians, we believe there's another side to this, and that is that we believe we as Christians have a soul, that there is soul formation that takes, so it's not just our mind, it's not just our bodies, but we have a spiritual side to us called the soul. The soul is what makes you, you. And that soul is your personality. It's the unseen part of you and that your soul can be formed just like your mind is formed and your heart is formed. Your soul is formed and the, the Christianese language for that is spiritual formation. And while it's important to take care of our bodies and our minds, we must also take care of our souls. Now, I, I want to be clear. There are some who will say that this body is all we have, right? Last week, I used the phrase flesh astronaut. And let me explain what I mean by that is our bodies, this is how we experience the world. But this body contains my soul. If I lose this hand, am I less of a person because of it? No, because the soul is untouched. The soul is separate from the body, but the body is how I experience the world. Does that make sense? The only way you can experience God is through your flesh. The only way that your mind can understand emotions is through your flesh. That's why you feel emotions. But where do you feel them? In your body. Now, the Bible tells us that not only do we have a body, but we have a heart, which is more than just the physical. It's the emotional. It's the judgment side of us. We have a mind. The mind is where we think. But it's our soul that is the, the part of us that's unseen, the part of us that is deeper, that's connected to the Lord. And so here's what we sometimes misunderstand is that the heart, mind, and body are not the soul, but they do make up part of the soul. In other words, the soul affects them both. And So picture it this way. If your soul gets hurt, it affects your mind, doesn't it? And what you put into your mind, does that shape your soul? Yes. In your heart, when your heart is hurt, does that affect your soul? Yes. When your soul is broken and twisted, does that affect your heart? Yes. Which then expresses itself through our bodies. Which is why we have to care about the whole being. We are whole creatures. We're not just soul creatures. We have body, minds, hearts, and souls. Last week we looked at what happens when the soul gets deformed. When it's not the way God intended it. How does that affect us? Because here's what happens. At a soul level, eventually when your soul is hurt, when your soul is twisted, eventually it will work itself out through you and onto other people. And therefore you now become the person who impacts other people's souls. But you do that through how you live, through your actions. This whole series is about the importance of what forms us and what is whether or not we are being transformed whether or not we are being hurt and deformed in the process, or the, today what we're going to be talking about is conformed. And what does it mean to be conformed at a soul level? And so if you would, if you're online with us, or if you're here, would you, well, actually online don't stand, because I don't know if you're standing or not, but would the rest of you stand as we read our scripture for today? This is Romans chapter 12, and this is Paul writing to the church in Rome. You guys ready? Here we go. Let's read this out loud. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing. The word of the Lord, praise be to God, you may be seated. How many of you have ever heard the phrase to be in the world but not of the world? Raise your hand if you've ever heard that before. Be in the world but not of the world. Here's what it essentially means. It means we as Christians live, we inhabit this physical space called the world. We're here. Where, I, where we are right now is in the world. But we're not supposed to be of, which means to be influenced by the world, 
spiritually. Did you know that that phrase is actually not found in Scripture? Look it up. Now, it comes from a paraphrase of something Jesus said, but what's happened is we've distorted it because we took what Jesus actually said and we condensed it, and in the process, we've missed a few things. Listen to what Jesus actually said in John 17. He's talking to the Father, and he's talking to the Spirit, and he's talking to his disciples. He says this, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. The goal is not that you're in the world, uh, in the world but not of the world. The goal is to be protected from the evil one as you live in this world. Now listen to the next part. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by truth. Your word is truth. The word sanctify just means set apart. It's where we get our word holy. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify, I set apart myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. These verses, along with what the Apostle Paul wrote in Colossians and in Romans and in what uh, First John, uh, the Apostle John wrote, listen to this, Colossians 2.20. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. First John wrote this, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. It's no wonder that in the 80s and 90s and 2000s we thought the goal was to get away from the world. Because when we read these verses, what does it sound like? It sounds like it's us versus them. That the world is messed up, we're the right ones, and we're not supposed to be a part of it. We're supposed to be separate from it. That's where that came from. And for years, that was my understanding. Because here's the thing. The Bible is very clear. The authors of the Bible make it known that our world is broken. Very clearly. Our world is broken by sin. It's deeply affected by sin. But the question is why? Sin affected humans... And because it affected humans, it messed with our soul. Who are the ones that God has entrusted the world with? Humans. The world is broken because we're broken. That's, the world itself is just a, it's a synonym or a metaphor for the reality that humans are the ones who are messed up at a soul level. And because of this, because humans are the ones who are broken, who are running the world, our ideologies, our philosophies, our governmental structures, our values and priorities are messed up. This is why the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6 says that the enemy, which is Satan, works through governmental structures and principalities and the thoughts of the world because of the twisting of humans. We are all broken because humanity is broken. Jesus himself offered this warning when talking to his disciples, and again, you've probably heard this before or some iteration of it. John 15, if the world hates you, Keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Again, it makes it sound like it's an us versus them. And in fact, that's where this whole idea of secular versus Christian came from. It came from this idea that if the church does it, if it's from Christians, then God puts a stamp on it. And if it's not from the church, it's bad. It's evil. Well, what does this lead to? Well, I think we've missed the point. At least here's what I, I, I can tell you I missed the point for years. I never actually read Jesus or Paul's or John's words in context. I took the verses out of context because that's what I was taught. I was taught it was the world against the Christians, secular versus uh, those who love Jesus. And here's the problem. If you actually look at who Jesus was writing to, and you guys ready for this? Check this out. When Jesus said... The world has hated me. Do you know where Jesus was when he wrote those words? He was in, the, in Israel. Israel was the nation of God's people. The world that Jesus was referring to was he's saying, listen, even God's people are going to hate me because I bring a different truth. The world he's referring to is the religious world. He wasn't talking about the Roman Empire, much less America. He was actually saying, my own people are going to hate you if you follow me. You know, that's still kind of true in the church, isn't it? If you actually try and love people like Jesus did, people in the church may not always like you. Now, he then take it a step further is because Israel has this divine and biblical claim that they are God's chosen people that's straight from Scripture. So what is Jesus getting at? Well, you got to remember, 
Jesus himself said, listen, they're going to hate you because they don't know me. This is not an attack on the Jews. It's an attack on humanity. How do I know that? Because then the Apostle Paul, who was writing to the church in Rome, and again, he's writing to God's people, Christians. And listen to what he says. When we read the text, do not taste, do not touch, or handle the world, do you know the context of it? I didn't for years. All you got to do is just read a little bit in Colossians, and here's what you'll discover. Paul is not talking about music. He's not talking about the arts. He's talking about legalism. He's talking about the human rules that tell you that the way to get to God is through you, through what you do, through your religious acts. And he says, have nothing to do with those. Don't touch them. Don't taste them. Don't handle them. Stay away from things that tell you that you can connect to God any way other than Jesus. And all this time, I thought he was talking about Metallica. The challenge, therefore, is not that you, it's us against the world. The challenge is so much deeper than that. See, we're called to be in this world. But Paul and Jesus, they're all challenging us. And who is he talking to? He's talking to God's people who are missing the mark. Even in Romans chapter 12, which was our verse for today, do not be conformed to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He was writing to the Roman Christian church. And here's what was going on in the church in Rome. There were Jewish Christians and there were Gentile Christians and they were arguing about who was more important, who was the better in the kingdom. Kind of like two siblings arguing over who daddy loves more. They're arguing and Paul's saying, listen, you're missing the point. This is not an us Christian versus them non-Christian issue. It's an everyone issue because guess what? You live in the world. You are part of the world. Therefore, as all human beings, Christian or not, we are all part of the problem. It is not us versus them. It's all of us, all humanity versus God. Even in the church, we're the ones who miss the point because we are people. And because we've made this assumption in the church that if it's Christian, that's what God puts a stamp of approval on, well, this has led to all kinds of messed up things in church history. Let me give you an example. The Crusades. The Crusades was the church putting God's stamp on violently overthrowing people. Does anybody look back on the Crusades and go, wow, that made Jesus look good? Or how about the Spanish Inquisition? Did you know that as far as 500 years ago, 500 years ago, that when Christians disagreed about baptism, whether or not you can baptize a baby or not, if they disagreed with you, they'd burn you at the stake. Because that's what Jesus would do. This is, regardless of the church, we are still human beings. And what happens is our job is to realize it's not us that does the work of holiness. It's the Holy Spirit in us who is calling us to be transformed. And as long as you and I live on this side of eternity, we are all still going to wrestle with this humanity, our broken, misshapen self. Would you agree with that? Whether you're in the church or not. And so what is the challenge here? Well, I think we have to ask a different set of questions. When we go to Romans 12, what does Paul mean when he writes, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world? In that, there's actually another question within the question, which is this. What are the patterns of the world that we tend to conform to? So in order to understand that, we have to think about what patterns are. A pattern is simply beliefs, instructions, or behaviors that are repeated over and over again. That's all a pattern is. How many of you guys remember making paper dolls when you were younger? Any girls make paper dolls? Maybe there's some guys. I don't know. I don't assume it's just women who did it. But you, what do you do? You put the pattern down and you cut it out. That's all a pattern is. It is a repeated instruction manual. Have you ever bought Ikea? Right? No lie. Okay, so we bought double bunk beds for my uh, uh, bunk beds for my kids. And Ikea instructions, I'm pretty sure, are from the devil. And, and so I'm reading it, and I get to the very last piece, and it won't fit. And here's what I discovered. The very first piece and the very last piece were the same pieces, but reversed. So I had to take the whole thing apart. <laughs> and, and it did not go well. Needless to say, when those things happen, there is a pattern that comes out in Jason that's not very great. And, and here's the thing, when our patterns get messed up, we get messed up. 
So when Paul is writing to the church in Rome, he's addressing a pattern of sin that is found throughout the pages of the Bible. And did you know, this is one of the reasons why I believe God's word is true. This is why I put my faith in God's word. My, my ultimate faith is in Jesus. It is not Father, Son, and Holy Scriptures. It's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But I believe that the Bible gives us the best possible explanation for the world. And what the Bible, the pages of the Bible, throughout its pages, what we find is that humans regularly conform to things other than God. We regularly have different patterns, decisions that we make, things that we've learned, that we've set in motion that do not line up with what God intended. And because of this, they become patterns. And no matter how good any of the heroes of the Bible might be, they all carry with them a certain level of brokenness. Amen? Moses murdered a man believing he was doing the right thing. David, King David, a man after God's own heart, committed rape, murder, and lied. Humans are never the heroes of the story. The only hero in the Bible is who? Jesus. Because Jesus was God become flesh. Humans are not the pattern. Jesus is the pattern. Who is the pattern? Jesus is the pattern. And so as we read Paul's words, what we're discovering is that Paul is saying, You've gone into a wrong pattern, and the pattern that you're going into is one that has affected the world from the beginning of time. But here's what I love about Paul. Instead of complaining or railing against the pattern of the world, which he had every right to do, in Romans chapter 1 we'll say, well, that's Paul railing against, he's complaining about all the world. No, Paul actually sets up an argument in Romans chapter 1. He says, the world looks like this, this, and this, and this, and this, and he points out all the things that the world has done wrong. And then Romans chapter 2, Paul says this, So Christians, what's your excuse? He's actually not criticizing the world. He's criticizing the people who say that we should be above the world, that are better than the world. He's saying, no, listen, we're all broken. So what does Paul do in Romans 12? Instead of complaining, railing against how evil Rome is and the Roman Empire, he does something very different. He shows a different way, a different pattern. Listen to Romans 12.3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Paul, without pointing fingers and wagging a finger at the Roman Empire, actually says, listen, the pattern of this world is pride and arrogance. And here's the best part. Why did Paul lead this way? I believe that Paul is trying to show us a different pattern. Jesus' pattern. A different way. Now, what does this have to do with us? Well, in the, the Christian church at that point in Rome, you had the Jewish Christians who were the firstborn. They were the ones that God brought into faith first. All the disciples were Jewish. And then later, the Gentiles became Christians, and now there was this fight about who was really the true church. Is it the Jewish Christians or the Gentile Christians? And, and Paul's like, you're both missing the point. You need to look at each other with sober judgment. Jews, you're right. God chose you first, but you didn't accept Jesus, and so Jesus went to the Gentiles. And Gentiles, you wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for the Jews. Get over yourself. I don't know about you, but I hear those words, and I'm like, ouch. Because here's the thing. I struggle with pride and arrogance. Anybody else here struggle with that? Anybody else here sometimes get a little too self-centered? So what does Paul do? He points out the patterns of sin that we find in the Old Testament where you have siblings fighting over each other, Jacob and Esau, Joseph and his brothers. And then you only have to look at the disciples. You'll find that the disciples weren't any better. This selfishness, this pride, this self-centeredness has always been a human problem because it is a pattern of the world. And guess who's in the world? We are. We are part of the problem. But Jesus has brought a different way. In other words, the pattern of the world Paul was saying the church was conforming to was one of arrogance, pride, and self-centeredness. But now he wants to show us a different pattern. One that is meant to expose the pattern of the world without shaming it. Instead, it makes you go, well, that doesn't look right. And, And so what does that mean for us? Well, what does Paul do in the rest of Romans 12? And here's my hope. I hope today... After you leave here, I'm going to give you a challenge. Read Romans chapter 12. One chapter. If you read Romans 12 every day for this week, you would begin to find that the Lord will begin to do some soul work in you. Listen to what Paul does. Again, he's showing a better way. 
He tells us to have sincere love, to hate what is evil, but to cling to what is good, to be devoted to one another. And then he uses all these other powerful examples of what it looks like when we live by the pattern of Jesus. Now, I, I want to show you just how real this issue is by pointing to people that we think should have it all put together, and that's the disciples. See, all you got to do is go to Luke chapter 9. Now, I love Luke chapter 9 because in it, um, okay, dads, I, I can't speak for moms, but how many of you have ever done like that your kids do something and you do this thing, you're like, uh, right? We have this moment where Jesus kind of does what I call the dad face, like, oh, seriously, come on, guys. So Jesus, in Luke chapter 9, he feeds the 5,000s. He's, he's delivering demons from people. He gets transfigured, which means he shows his glory. And then he tries to tell his disciples that he's going to die. And his disciples aren't listening. And so he does some more stuff. And then he tries to tell them again. And he's like, listen, guys, I'm going to die. But the disciples are so self-centered, so ambitious, so filled with pride and arrogance, they can't hear what Jesus is saying. Like, okay, whatever, Jesus. But here's the real question. Who's the goat? Who's the greatest of all time here? Is it, is it me? Am I, am I? They start arguing among each other who's going to be the greatest. And I picture Jesus going, seriously? Really? I just fed 5,000 people. You just saw me transfigured and you're arguing who's going to be the greatest? So what does Jesus do? Instead of calling them out, instead of pointing his finger and going, you bunch of morons, are you not listening to me? Instead, he looks and he sees a child walk by. Now, in the ancient world, they, we may think that children are innocent. Anybody here have children think they're innocent? No one, no one believes children are innocent. So why does he grab a child? He doesn't grab a child because a child is innocent. The only people who wanted children around were their parents. To everybody else, children were nuisances because they didn't work. All they did was take. They were a burden. Jesus sees this child walking by, and he knows the disciples' hearts. So he picks up a child, and he says, hey, listen, you see this child? Anyone who welcomes this child welcomes me and the Father who sent me. The least of you is the greatest among you. Why did Jesus do it that way? Why didn't he just call out their stupidity? I mean, isn't that what the rest of us would want to do? Like, come on, you dummies, what are you doing? And instead, Jesus shows a different way. He brings a child up. But they're still not done arguing yet. They're still... Again, this is the us versus them. Either you're in the circle or you're out. And one of the disciples, John, says, Hey, Jesus, um, I, I know the whole children thing. That's great. But we saw this dude, and he was casting out demons in your name, but he's not part of the inner circle. So we set him straight. And Jesus looks at him, and again, I picture Jesus going like this. Really, guys? Come on. And he goes, If he's not against us, he's for us. Why do you think it's so important to be a part of this? If he's doing it in my name, he's not against us, he's for us. But they're still not done. Jesus had two brothers, sons of Zebedee. And the sons of Zebedee, they were kind of um, rambunctious, uh, sometimes a little violent. And, and, and they actually were very ambitious. And they kind of thought the goal was to take over by force. It was military, right? And so Jesus is walking through Samaria and the Samaritans are rejecting Jesus' message. So the sons of Zebedee, who Jesus called sons of thunder, band name I call it. Um, the sons of thunder, by the way, it's already a band name. I looked it up. But So sons of thunder, they go like, Jesus, Jesus, how about this? Can we call down fire from heaven to burn up your enemies? Okay, I want you to think about this for a second. These guys have been with Jesus for a couple years now and they're still not getting it. They're with Jesus, the author of life, the word become flesh, and they're still thinking through the patterns of the world. Why? Well, they're missing one key component that hasn't been given yet, the Holy Spirit. See, what transforms your mind from the pattern of this world is the work of the Holy Spirit in you. It is not because you read a book or took a class. Now, I'm not saying that reading books or taking classes are bad, but if you're doing them apart from the Holy Spirit... That's you still following the pattern of the world, which it's the self-help pattern of the world. No, it's the Holy Spirit through God's Word in community that shapes us, that transforms the way we think and see the world. Does that make sense? Everybody tracking with me? And so as we look at this, what we discover is that Jesus is calling us to a different way, and it's no longer us versus them thinking, because we are the us. It's no longer about pride or violence or arrogance or boasting. It's instead God is calling us to show the world a different way. So I, I, I want to lay before you today three ways we can maybe approach culture. Two of them are not great. One of them, I believe, is the way of Jesus. 
The first way is what I call anti-culture. And sadly, we see this a lot in, in, in the Christian church right now where it's us against them. We fire, fire with fire. We are radicalized. We do things to, you know, we've got to be against culture. We've got to push against culture. But here's the thing. Did you know that Jesus was never anti-cultural? Let me give you an example. Someone asked Jesus, should we pay taxes? And Jesus pulls out a coin. He says, see this coin? Who's on the, fa- who's on the face of the coin? I'm like, well, Caesar. And he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. He doesn't rail against Caesar. He goes, no, that's man's law. Obey that. But ultimately, give your heart to God. Give to God's what is God, which is the rest of you. Jesus could have gone against Caesar. He could have gone against the, all those things, and he chose not to. Why? Because Jesus was not anti-culture. Not all of culture is bad. It's just the parts that have been affected by soul brokenness. Or the Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 12, we just read part of it. In Romans 13, he actually says, listen, don't go against the governing authorities. Now, what you may not realize is that the Roman Empire was way more messed up than America ever is. The Roman Caesars, they were feeding Christians to lions. One of them, Nero, crucified Peter upside down. And yet, in the midst of this broken system, what does the Apostle Paul say? Obey the governing authorities because God put them there. So if we're not supposed to be anti-cultural, if we're not, what does it mean to be against? No, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be against the lies. There are things within our culture that are evil and broken. Yes, it's okay to stand up. I praise God that we live in America. I do. Now let's be clear. I do not believe America is a Christian nation. We are hopefully a nation filled with Christians. Amen? But because of that, We live in a country that you get to vote your conscience. But regardless of who is elected president, you don't have to vote for them. But once they become president, you respect the office. Doesn't mean you respect the person, you respect the office. Does that make sense? That is not anti-cultural. That is recognizing that God has allowed that person to be in office. And our job is to show them a better way, a different way. Now, we live in a governmental system where we get to vote our conscience. And I praise the Lord for that because there are a lot of systems that don't allow that. That also means here as Christians, we get an opportunity. We are told to have a voice. I praise God for that. But the second view, if we're not meant to be anti-cultural, is one that for years I thought was my goal, which was to be counter-cultural. How many of you guys know that language? You need to be counter-culture. It's us versus them. It's going against the grain, the courage to be different. And there's all kinds of pictures. You know, you got to swim against the current. Okay. Paul said, do not be conformed by the pattern of this world. But if the goal is countercultural, meaning to go against culture, there are all kinds of ways that are non-conforming. For instance, did you know that punk rock was originally came about because of people not conforming to culture? Punk rock music scene is non-conforming. Goth is non-conforming. Political incorrectness right now is non-conforming. Walking around naked in the street is non-conforming. I praise the Lord that all of you are non are conforming to the world right now. And I know you all are grateful that I'm conforming by wearing clothes. Non-conforming doesn't mean good. It, that, that, just because you're non-conforming doesn't mean you're doing the right thing. If lame, cheesy music is non-conforming, then we were crushing it in the 90s as a church. So what is God calling us to? I think, again, if the goal is not about being anti-cultural or counter-cultural, there might be a third way. What if the goal is to be redeeming culture? Because redeeming is taking what is broken and showing a different way. It's not saying that the whole system is bad. It's us now showing a different world, which may look counter-cultural, but our goal is not to wag fingers or to stand out. Our goal is to show a better way. And I believe this is the way of Jesus, that when we look at Jesus, we see See, anti-culture, counter-culture always focuses on the behavior. What we want to focus on is not the behavior, but the heart, the soul, the mind. Because when God gets a hold of your soul, when He gets a hold of your heart and your mind, it changes how you live. What if we begin to look at the goal of the church, not just Zion, but of all Christians? What if our goal was to bring a redemptive culture? What if it was about allowing the Holy Spirit, God's Word, and a biblical community to form our minds instead of our brokenness and the brokenness of the world. How much more appealing would that be? Imagine when somebody who's not a Christian sees how you love your neighbor and they go, I don't understand that. You're calling out the brokenness in the world, but not through shame. You're doing it through, by showing a different way. 
Think about it this way. Who did Jesus hang out with? Sinners. He hung out at parties with the wrong people, and who did not like Jesus? The religious people. Here's what I think that means. I think we as Christians should be the ones that everybody wants to have at their party, not because we're drinking or because we're drunk, but because we are fun to be around. Jesus was fun to be around. Well, the only way you can do that is you have to be a person who is what? Fun to be around. We begin to show a different way. And if you read the rest of Romans 12, what you'll find is that's pretty darn appealing. You see people that are want to be drawn in. And, and I think this opens the doors that we're modeling for them a new pattern, the pattern of Christ, which looks very different than the pattern of this world. And it's done through the, the working and the transforming of our hearts. So I'm going to invite the band up and I'm going to have you guys stand. I, I want you to hear these next last words. Would you stand with me and Listen to this next part, and, and we're going to wrap up here. There are people who step into the doors of the church who are exploring faith. Some of them have never been to church. Others, maybe they came to church a long time ago, and, and they walk in through the doors of the church. And you know how many people who I know, because I've been told, the first thing that they're nervous about is, what are people thinking about me? How many people are judging me when I walk through the doors of the church? They, they know me. And, and you know what goes, here's the hard part. You want to you know why they think that? Because what is the church notorious for? Being judgy. Being judgmental. Thinking it's our job is to wag fingers at people. And, and I can't blame them for feeling that. And I said this last week. You know what the beautiful thing is? The truth is, most of the time when you walk through the doors, most people are so concerned about their own brokenness, they're not thinking about yours. But it's what we do outside of the church that has formed that opinion, not inside. So how do we change that? How do we change that when someone walks in through the doors of the church that they see this as a place where they get to encounter a loving God who doesn't just love them but likes them? Maybe you're dealing with some of that stuff. I know for a fact that there are people in this room who right now are struggling who are struggling with a, a broken soul whose hearts and minds have been hurt, who are struggling with sins, and maybe that's where you are. And I'm here to tell you that God can begin a new work. Now, I, I want to give a warning here, okay? Some of you might have heard or you might have thought what I said was this. It doesn't matter what you listen to or what you watch. No, it absolutely does. It really does. What you listen to and watch does matter, but the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 says, listen, as Christians... Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Here's what Paul's really saying is, you have absolute freedom to watch and listen to garbage, to do garbage things. But when Jesus has gotten a hold of your heart and mind, when Jesus has transformed your soul, you don't want those things anymore. You want to know the evidence that you might be leaning into the wrong things is that you crave the wrong things. How many of you have ever dieted before, tried to get away from sugar and carbs? Raise your hand. How many of you? Okay, what happens that first week when you try to stop going with sugar and carbs? You're like, I'm going to die. I can't think. Why? Because your brain and body have gotten so used to sugar and carbs that you think literally, I'm not going to survive without them. But what happens? In a couple weeks, you no longer crave sugar and carbs because your body is transformed. You need a soul transformation that reminds you that literally you no longer crave the pattern of the world. You no longer crave the gross, disgusting things that go against God. And so this morning, I, I want to give you an opportunity. You guys want to know how to begin this transformation? We can begin it right now. Are you ready for this? If you want this, I'm going to give you a very simple prayer. I'm just going to have you repeat after me. Only if you want it. If you don't mean it, don't say it, okay? Simply goes like this. If you want it, repeat after me. Holy Spirit, transform me. Give me a new mind. Give me new eyes. Give me a new heart. Restore my soul. In the name of Jesus, heal me. I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to end with this. If the goal is not to have Christian music or Christian movies, which again, that's okay. I'm not saying those are bad things. But I think the real thing, what God wants us to be, is not to have Christian music, but to have music, musicians who are Christians. Did you know if you were to go into my library and you look on my book of leadership shelves, 90% of my books are written by people who don't love Jesus because they're good leaders. Why is it that I have so few leadership books written by Christians that are good? Because the church has not done a great job of showing leadership. Honestly, if we took this challenge seriously of bringing redemptive culture, 
the people who are not Christians in the world should be looking to the church saying, we want to, whatever you're doing, we want that. Our music, for centuries, if you wanted great music, you went to the church. For centuries, if you wanted some of the, the most scientific minds, they were found in people who loved Jesus. Our job is not to make a Christian government. Our job is to have a government filled with Christians. Amen? This is what it means to be redemptive culture. Our job is to show them a new pattern, a new way, the way of Christ filled with truth, grace, mercy, and love of Jesus. And my hope is that for us as a church that we would take this seriously, that whether you're a firefighter, whether you are a teacher at a school or you own a business or, or whether you're a, uh, you, you work in the hospital, whatever you might be, what if God has placed you there to be a different pattern, not to call out, but to show a better way? By following Jesus. Amen? We're going to end in this last worship song. And as we sing this, I want you to think about these songs again. When it says that you keep on getting better, God does not keep on getting better. He's the same. Rather, we begin to see Him through better eyes. We begin to see how God moves in better ways. And as we sing this and as we take our tithes and offerings, I, my hope, my prayer is your pastor is that we would begin to see how good God is because isn't that what we want God, we want people to see in the world around us is how good God is, amen? So as we sing this last worship song, I want to invite you, let us lift our voices, our hearts, let us minister to the Lord, but more importantly, let it be a prayer. And so when you're ready, I want to invite you to bring your tithes and offering. Let's come and end with the time in worshiping the Lord. I will sing of your goodness. I will sing of your love. Though the seasons come quickly, I have always been enough. Though you can bring your tithes and offerings if you have darker, them. Though the waiting seems long, you have always been faithful. Remind me of your love. Keep on getting better, yeah, keep on getting better.
benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May we go out and show the world a different way by redeeming culture. May we be the hands and feet of Jesus in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you guys so much for coming. God is always moving. Amen? Thanks for being here. Seeing you are good, you are.